Alright, we're here tonight to discuss Tchelet, and, and essentially we watched the movie, but the movie touched on certain issues that I'd like to expand. You know, I remember as a kid, since you read the Parashah of Shemaisen, uh, Kanaf Petil Tchelet, and, and the Siddur never translates the word Tchelet, it always says Tchelet, and there's some fancy footnote in every Siddur about, oh, we don't have this dye, there used to be an animal called the Chilazon, we don't know where to find it, and because of that we don't have Tchelet. And I always remember kissing that, those tzitzit and wondering, like one day, maybe one day the Mashiach will come and we'll find that chilet again. And we'll be able to get back to the way the Torah meant for us to keep, to keep the mitzvah of tzitzit, to observe the mitzvah of tzitzit. But I think to understand what chilet really means, you have to look at what happened. What, what did the chilet mean to the Jewish people then? What happened? Why did it disappear? Did it really disappear? I mean, do we really even believe the Jews that the chilazon disappeared? Is there such a teaching? Or did we phase out of using it because we left our land, because of all kinds of other things? Thank you. That, that might have happened. There should be... Did you get one of these? Oh, okay. Thank you. <coughs> and so we're going to start on the page of topics in Perek HaTechelet. I forgive the S's in here. This article was written <laughs> by Rabbi Beryl Wine, and oh. I figured that uh, when it comes to Jewish history, uh, there are few as, as knowledgeable as him. So uh, let's, let's start with an article of his. It's part of a larger packet. I only brought you the first two sources, two sections in this packet. Uh, someone read for us the first paragraph. <clears throat> sure. One of the enduring. One of the enduring mysteries of Jewish life following the exile of the Jews from the land of Israel was the disappearance of the observance of including a string of tehillah in the tzitzit garment that Jews wore. Tehillah was known to be of a royal blue color, while the other strings of the tzitzit were white in color. Not only did Jews stop wearing tehillah, they apparently even <coughs> forgot how it once was manufactured. The Talmud identified Tehillet as being produced from the quote-unquote blood of a sea creature called Chilazon, and though the Talmud did specify certain traits and identifying characteristics belonging to the Chilazon, that description was never specific enough for later generations of Jews to unequivocally determine which sea creature was in fact the Chilazon. It was known that the Chilazon was harvested in abundance along the northern coast of the land of Israel, from south of present-day Haifa to just north of present-day Tyre in Lebanon. That's from uh, Masech Shabbos 26a in the Talmud. <clears throat> Though the Tehillet itself disappeared from Jewish life as part of the damage of exile, the subject of Tehillet was discussed in the great halachic works of the ages. Just as the Jews did not forget Zion in Jerusalem, their subconscious memory of past glory and spiritual greatness kept the Chilet alive in their memory, if not in actual practice. So we've always yearned for coming back to this Mitzvah of Chilet. Dan, you're like a professional reader. Can I ask you to continue? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. There are a number of basic questions that require study in order for any determination of the possibility of actually observing the Chilet in our time to occur. The three main questions are, one, when and why did Tehillet disappear from the Jewish world? Two, which sea creature is actually the Chilazon, and how can the blue dye be manufactured from it? And three, even if the Chilazon can be positively identified and Tehillet processed from it, is it within our halachic power to revive a lost commandment, the tradition, or Masorah, of which has also been lost? So those three questions would appeal to very different audiences. If those who would care, like, historically, is this the real Tehillet, or when did the Tehillet disappear? The third one is going to <coughs> deal with your Abnaqsha's Jew of. Okay, you can prove to me this is the real Tehillet. You can tell me this is what they use in the temple, but who says that I have the right to reinstitute this custom to the Jewish people? Those Jews uh, are generally beyond all hope, but we're going to attempt <laughs> as much as possible to convince them why if Hashem thought it was a good idea, we can still do this kind of mitzvah today. So isn't, that in this, isn't that the same argument as... You know, rebuilding the Beit Mikdash. How can we build it now? We don't know how to do it. Blah blah. You know. You could argue that rebuilding the Beit Mikdash is directly no, no. You, yeah. is directly connected to the Mashiach and then bringing back. Tchelet is not one of those mitzvot, and we'll see inside. It's not one of those mitzvot that is contingent upon the coming of Mashiach. That you know, you can make a greater case for why you shouldn't go to Israel until the Mashiach comes, as than why you shouldn't reintroduce the custom of having a blue string on your tzitzit, but. Let's not get ahead. This is a good. This is the third point is probably going to appeal so to more of our religious Tehillet brethren then. and the Torah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> these yeah. questions. Uh, these questions, which have always existed and been discussed in halachic and rabbinic literature, began to move from the realm of purely intellectual and speculative 
to the arena of actual Jewish practice about 125 years ago. Since then, <coughs> the search for the Chilzon and the debate about renewing the observance of Dechelet has been intensified until it now has achieved the status of discussion regarding practical behavior and observance. Very good. So we've, we've switched. There's been a shift uh, inside of the Jewish world. <laughs> so I'm going to read the next paragraph for us. There have been various... There have been various dates and reasons attributed to the demise of Tehillot in the Jewish world. In the ancient world, <laughs> the later in the world of Rome, the colors of purple and blue were reserved for royalty and the upper classes. The Romans were especially jealous of their governmental monopoly on producing dyes for the royal purple and blue. The Talmud records the arrest of two rabbis from Israel who were smuggling <laughs> to hail it into the Jewish community of Babylon. So you see that this is, right in the Talmud, we see the Romans were jealous of this color. Like they had a monopoly on it, this was a royal color, you're an occupied nation, you don't have the right to be using a royal color. This could very well be the reason for why the was phased out, even when the Jews lived in Israel. It was just that under persecution we weren't able to do such a thing. And not out of any halachic decision that was made in the Talmud. The Talmud also records that Tehillot was brought to Babylon in the time of Rav Achai, around 500 CE, according to Mechanot 43a. There is no specific reference in the Talmud that (coughs) Jews were not able to obtain and wear Tehillot. Since the final reaction of the Babylon Talmud occurred around 570 CE, Rabbi Itzhak Halevi Herzog the late chief rabbi of Israel in his seminal work of Tehillot assumes that the Tehillot manufacturing factories in the land of Israel were destroyed during the time of Muslim conquest of the country in around 638. So you find that even after the Romans were in Israel, we still had Tehillot, records of Tehillot coming and going. Rather, it must be a corner of Herzog that it only stopped much later when the Muslims began to take over the land of Israel. In any event, the range of dates advanced for the disappearance of the Tehillot in, in, in the Jewish world extends from the late 5th century. Rabbi Yeshua Kutner and Yeshuot Malkot Rachaim. Uh, to the 15th century, with the fall of the Constantinople in the 15th century, with the fall of Paul Constantine and the Muslims in 1453, mentioned by Rav Herzog as a possibility, though he personally rejects it. Mar HaShalom Gon, who died in 859, Rav Nachshan Gon, who died in 889, and Rav Shemul Ben Chafni Gon, and then Rav Yitzhak Asi. That's the riff. Oh, and then Rambam, and many other great Gonim of Babylon and Rishonim of Spain and France uh, uh, bemoan the disappearance of the Tehillot from the Jewish scene. From all of this, it seems clear that the Tehillot was no longer available by the time of the zenith of the Muslim conquest in the Mediterranean basin and the Balkans in the 7th century. Rabbi David ben Zimra of Cairo stated at the end of the 15th century that uh, Chalazon may certainly yet exist in the waters of the Mediterranean, but that we are unable to harvest it. This situation remained in effect until the end of the 19th century. So essentially you find that people were sad about the loss of Tehillot. They, they don't seem to make any mention of it being removed from the world, or quite to the country. They believe there was this chilazon out there, and just that we were not able to harvest it. And different rabbis in different generations are recording when that ended in their countries, or in their regions where they were in their exile. And who wants to read the next uh, paragraph? As for the remaining two questions. As for the remaining two questions regarding Tehillus, the identity of the sea creature called she chilazon, chilazon and whether a lost commandment and tradition can be revived after centuries of absence. There entered on the scene in 1889 Rabbi Sharon Gershon Hinoch Leiner, the Rajmir, Rajnir? Redziner, Rebbe. Rebbe. So he uh, was the head of the Hasidic group called Redzin, and Redzin today still produces their own kind of tchelet. We're going to read about the tragic story in a minute. Rabbi, Rabbi Leiner claimed that the 
Key Lazon was a squid and he actually produced thousands of sets of chizits that included a blue string made from a dye obtained from that squid. I have one right here. Oh, okay. That's uh, the squid one? That's the squid Can you one. you pass that around? Yeah, I will. And then we're we're going to get to the... Which he believed was, was oh. Tehillis. He defended his contentions in a massive three-volume work of Torah scholarship entitled... Svunei uh, Temunei Chol, Ptil Tehillet, and Ein Hatchelet. Okay. However, Rabbi Herzog, in his 1913 dissertation, already proved that Rabbi Lanier's squid was not the Kilazon. <coughs> Rather, he advanced the theory that the Kilazon <coughs> was a snail, Murex trunculis, that yep. had been discovered in Mediterranean waters by a French zoologist. Henri Lacaze Duthers, Duthers in 1857. Let me pause you right here. I should just let you know what happened with the Redzina Rebbe. The Redzina Rebbe paid, he, was a, he paid scientists to rec- figure out for him. He said, these are the criteria that Talmud puts forth for the Kilazon. He was either in Poland, or I don't know exactly where he lived, but in Europe. And he said, can you find an animal in the sea that can produce a certain color dye? It needs to look like this, and it needs to have these character traits. <laughs> and they actually did. They they came out with a, a dye, and they claimed that a squid, I believe it was called a cuttlefish, that was the word that they, they specifically breathed. Uh, when they put it inside of a chemical mixture, which the Talmud mentioned, there was a chemical process that Khaled goes through, it turned blue. And for the Redzina Rebbe wrote three books. This is the Tchelet. We have the Tchelet. Everyone must start doing it. He is referred to in Ashkenazi circles as the Baal HaTchelet, the master of the Tchelet. He was the one who brought back Tchelet. We've heard so in 1913 when he was doing his PhD dissertation on this topic of Tchelet. He came to the very sad conclusion that Rav, uh, the Redzina Rebbe was misled by scientists that worked for him. And rather, any organic uh, matter that you put inside of this chemical mixture will come out blue. You can cut up your salmon, you could throw some turkey in there, whatever you want will come out blue. And so essentially the Redzina Rebbe was duped, and he gave him the credit. He was the one who started the movement of rediscovering Tchelet. The fact of the matter is today, you still have Redzina Chassidim, who wear this Tchelet, they sell it today in Israel. You can get a bag like this for about 40 shekels. So that's like 10, 12 dollars. And the price alone tells you something about it. A few other things tell you, this Tchelet easily rubs off on clothing. So if you wear this, you'll notice they don't sell it with the white strings inside of the bag, because if they did, the white strings would turn blue. It rubs off very easily on the other <laughs> strings. It makes if people wear khaki pants, you'll see like blue skid marks on their pants. <laughs> um, you mentioned, you heard in the video, one of the traits of Tchelet that a rabbi said, it was the most steadfast dye that they had in the Middle East. This was the kind of dye that once it went into wool, you couldn't take it out. The Tchelet that we wear, not the Redzina Tchelet. You could put it in bleach for 10 minutes and nothing will happen to it. Wow. Wow. It's a steadfast diet. It holds on tight to whatever it is. And uh, essentially, with all due respect to the Redziner Hasidim and the breast of Hasidim, who do wear this tchelet, we understand that they have an idea to respect their Rebbe, but at a certain point, the Torah is a Torah of truth. And you don't have to agree that our tchelet is correct, but at the very least you could say, you know, if I could throw my, my shawarma into there and it would come out blue, it tells you something about this material and that that squid is not what made yeah. the tchelet blue. And, but they, Breslov seems to have, had, I'd have to research it more, seems to have had a historic relationship with the Redziners. Either they were connected somehow, or they had influenced somehow, or Rabbi Nachman must have accepted the Redziner. I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but some Breslovers wear his Tchelet. Do the Redziners switch now that they know that the no. love is better? So they still no. wear they one still that, wear that does the fade and does... Yes. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. Actually, to the point where Israeli dry cleaners, like in Yerushalayim, mm-hmm. they won't do Tchelet, because they're afraid you're going to give them Redziner Tchelet, and the rest of their laundry is going to come out blue. So, so is there anything wrong with if the thing died at the rest of the tali? So is there anything wrong? With Halachically, that? no. It just it tells it's you that it's not the real chilet. The yeah, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just not doing anything right either. Uh, so Rav Herzog began the journey in, in great thanks to the Redzina Rebbe. So we still consider the Redzina Rebbe the father of the chilet movement, but he didn't discover the true chilet. Rav Herzog was convinced that this murex trunculus was the was the right. Was the, was the true tchelet. The problem was, it always came out purple, not blue, like you saw in the video. So really want to keep on reading? I the problem. Rabbi Herzog was disappointed by the fact that the dye obtained from this snail was purple in color 
and not the blue indigo necessary for tequilas. The problem that Rabbi Herzog raised was solved by a chance discovery by Otto Elcher, Elchner of the Schenker Institute in Tel Aviv in the early 1980s. He discovered that the liquid extracted from the gland of the snail when exposed to the air turns purple in color. However, during the dyeing process, when it is exposed to direct sunlight, it turns into a brilliant indigo blue. And that happened to him by accident in 1980. Like you saw, he left it in the window, yeah. and the sunlight hit it and it turned blue instead of purple. And in 1980, Rav that's that's what answered Rav Herzog's question. <clears throat> the many thousands of Jews who wear tehillis today in their zizits obtain their tehillis strings from the dye of this murex trunculus snail. Except, of course, for the Radziner, is that Red, Radziner, Radziner. Radziner Hasidim, who follow the Rebbe's opinion that his squid was a kilazon. There seems to be little doubt today that the snail Murex trunculus is indeed the long lost elusive kilazon. Okay. We're going to skip the next paragraph. I'll, let, I'll summarize it to you. The Briska Rav, who was the, the head of the Soloveitchik dynasty, had an opposition to Tchelet. And he had, there are two different accounts as to why he opposed to it. Mm. Based on the accounts, you'll discover that some briskers will be open to wearing chelet and some will not. Uh, the briskers in general are a very conservative branch of the Lithuanian Jewish community. And his whole thing was, if we lost the Mesora of having chelet, uh, his the main opinion of his is that it's not that we lost the blue and now we regained it, but rather there was a tradition to not have blue. Mm. This is how briskers learn. You have to, it's, they rephrase, reword, and then repackage. It's not that we didn't have blue and so we had to have white, but rather, because we lost the blue, we developed the tradition to have white. And to change the tradition that is, for sure, with a tradition that is maybe, he held that it wasn't a proper halachic scenario, and, and that was his conclusion, probably not to wear tchelet. It could be that he would change his mind today based on a number of, of things that we'll discover in a minute. Let's read this last paragraph. There's a statement in the Midrash. There's a statement in Midrash, Midrash Tan Huma, Shalach 28, Tamid Bar Raba, that the Chelet was nig- nignaz, hidden, put away. Do you remember this? That you've heard this before, probably. That the Chilazon was taken away from this world. That's how they understand the Midrash Tan Huma. So we would say today, uh, endangered species are extinct. Yeah, or in a, on a supernatural mm-hmm. level that Hashem removed this animal mm-hmm. from the world. From a supernatural level, but the natural... I don't, on a rationalist level, point. that's how you could understand this. Yeah. There are those that maintain this statement also precludes the use of Tehillet in our time, but it seems clear this is not the intention of Midrash, especially since Tehillet was still in use after the time of the writings of this Midrash. Rabbanim such as Rabbi Yechel Mechal Tichun Chinsky... You use his timing when you finish your fast early. He's always the one with the leading oh, opinion okay. about ending your fast. Thank you, That's Rabbi Yechim. <laughs> I've interpreted the Midrash as meaning that the Chelet became less and less common, but not that it disappeared completely. Nor was this Midrashic statement intended to prevent the use of the Chelet among Jews of later generations. There is no unanimity in current rabbinic opinion regarding this question of reintroduction to Chelet into Jewish life and practice. Though as an empiric observation, the use of Tehillah continues to spread widely through the Jewish people. One thing is certain, Tehillah has become a living issue, has left the exclusivity of the study hall, <coughs> and entered into the everyday life of tens of thousands of Jews all over the world. So you find already that this is not something that's discussed in the Benjamin Midrash. These three guys went to the beach, they pulled out snails from the water, and they opened up a company that is dealing uh, with Tehillah. Let me share with you my personal story. 2009. 2008, I came to Israel. I met Arav Peretz. I spent the first six weeks knowing him, wishing that I didn't. Um, two <laughs> months later, I became a very close student of Arav Peretz. Mm-hmm. There was a certain struggle. He, he broke many of the norms that I, I was trained or was told are orthodox, are traditional, are halachic. And Arav Peretz pushed us to push and to, to think not just outside of the box, but showed us that the box was all a fabrication of other people's imaginations. And one of those things, 2009, repaired, disappeared. Maybe two days, three days, I don't remember how long. He didn't give shear. Came back, and, you know, we're, we're at a butt, like, what happened? Rabbi, are you okay? Was, were you feeling well? 
he takes the microphone and he said, anybody who wants to know what the King Mashiach is going to wear on his tzitzit, I found it. <laughs> Great. Goes back to my first six weeks of yeshiva. Yeah. <laughs> no, here is the no, Rav he, <laughs> Rav Peretz had taken a trip to the Tchelet factory. He, Rav Peretz's books are all named Emet Liakov, the truth to Yaakov. Rav Peretz, if there's one thing he's particular about, is to never lie. And that means that if Rav Peretz, you ask him what time it is, he won't tell you unless it's exactly at 4.15, he won't tell you at 4.14 that it's 4.15. He will not exaggerate. Rav Peretz never speaks in exaggerations. And if you come to, oh, there are a thousand people at that event, Rav Peretz will presume that you actually mean there were a thousand people at that event. And it might sound rigid, but it, lies don't come out of his mouth. One thing you'll never go down in the books for is lying. To the point where I could tell you that if I know how Rav Peretz he probably skips the lying part of his vidui. Probably doesn't say it. And he knows it doesn't, even when Shabbat starts, I told you this before, he leaves his house, he doesn't tell his wife Shabbat Shalom. Because Shabbat didn't start yet, only by the time he comes home did Shabbat truly begin. Mm-hmm. So he tells his wife Shalom before Mincha. When he comes home, Shabbat Shalom. He's very particular with this. And when it comes to Tchelet, he said, listen, I can't rule on something based on books. I have to go see it myself. And he went, he took a trip, he sat with rabbis, show me, show me what you found, tell me how it's really true. Sat with Gemarot, he sat with the Rishonim, and he came back, this is the real Tchelet. How is this the real Tchelet? It's easy for me to tell you, this is the real Tchelet, nothing else. But let's talk about it. I have in our second packet, um, identifying the Chilazon. It's the last two pages. So keep your other packet where it is, and identifying the Chilazon. I'm going to go through a few pieces of the Gemara. The Gemara has random hints as to what is the Chilazon, where, what is this animal, what comes out of it. And from that, we have to compare it to today, and you'll see very quickly that the Tchelet that we have, which, by the way, is sold only, only in packages like this. Anything not sold like this, anything not sold like this is a counterfeit. And actually today, I think they've been forging these. They have all kinds of holographic stickers on this. The price of this in Israel is 220 shekels, which is much more than the 40 shekels that those cost. Oh, because only a petil to kill it. They're the only ones who do it. Now, I've heard that there have been some companies on the side trying to break through and do it. And it seems to be a very tedious process. And uh, I would like to tell you that they were fair with their market price. But this has always been historically expensive. So... uh, Let's leave it at that. They're the only people doing it for now. So these are indelible? They don't rub off? Nothing. And we'll read about this now. They, they, you could wash them. You could put them in a yeah. washing machine. They will stay the same blue. They don't fade in the sun. You want to turn your white shirt blue. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Um, let's, let's read this together. So the first thing is the Talmudic description. It says in Masechet Shabbat, Tzaydei Chilazon, to the fishers, the tzaydei, they're those who fish for the Chilazon, the fish of the Chilazon are from Haifa to Sulamot Shel Tzur, the ladders of Tyre. So you can at least get from the Talmud a g- general description of where the Chilazon hangs out. And the, everything, if you want to know the sources are, the last page I put the sources away, I got all the information from. Archaeological digs show remnants of the dying industry on the northern coast of Israel through the southern coast of Lebanon. Digs near Haifa and Tyre and beyond reveal mounds of murex shells broken to access their dye stuff, some up to 100 yards long and several yards thick. So we find the shells in Israel, archaeological digs are coming up with shells of snails that were broken at the same spot that you need, like we saw in the video, the same spot which is necessary to reach those glands that have uh, the color inside of them. Mm. Shell. Several yards thick. Yeah, it's like a huge you know, dump of these. <laughs> of these snails. It must have been a, a factory or whatever it would have been then. Shell, the Talmud description. Potsea. Potsea is the Hebrew word for breaking, open. One who breaks open a chilazon. That's what Masech Shabbat says. So it's not, it's not a squid. You can't can break open a squid. You can slice open a squid. But break open, the wording here is something hard. Eshir Hashirim, the Midrash Rabbah, Eshir Hashirim says, Go and learn about the clothes of the Jews in the desert, from the Chilazon. All the time that it grows, it shells. Nartiko grows with it, which is what the snail shell does. This Chilazon, the shell grows with it. A squid doesn't have a body part that grows with it on top, and so it's obvious from this Gemara that this uh, Murex snail is, is the Chilazon. The other rabbi who claimed it was a squid, I mean, obviously did a tremendous amount, amount of research, three, three volumes. volumes I mean, so all of the things that he brought 
I don't, I don't have those books in my possession. So I have another book, which was written about, if you want to look around in this while we talk, there's a lot of pictures in here about the snails and the squids and, and different such things. It's all in Hebrew, but I'm sure through the pictures you'll discover something. And he, we already disproved his theory, not because of what he wrote, but because of the science that went into it. Um, Rav Herzog writes that the use of verb potzeh to break open like as a nut. The murex snail is hard. The shells found in the archaeological digs were broken in the exact spot necessary to obtain the dye. To obtain the dye. So we find that, uh, truthfully, there already was a trade using the murex in the land of Israel historically. Expense. We talk about how expensive this is. The Talmud says in Menachot, the chilazon is this. Its body is like the sea. Its creation is like a fish. It comes up once in 70 years, and with its blood, one dies tchelet. Due to this, it is expensive, says the Talmud. We'll discuss some of these, like the 70 years, in a minute. But let's put that on the side. We know that tchelet has to be expensive. Expensive generally comes from... What makes something expensive? Rare. It's rare. rare. It's rare. difficult to produce. I mean, you have a lot of it, but it takes a lot. The, the work efficiency is not so great. And uh, the demand. The demand is much greater than what you could produce. Remember that that glands that we saw, it's tiny compared to the snail. You know how many snails you need to dye a whole string of tchelet? The vagueness of these descriptions make them ineffective for use in identification. Other more indicative signs could have been given if that was the intention of the Gemara. So essentially, Rav Herzog comes to the conclusion that the reason the Gemara says what it says is just to tell you that it's expensive. The other things here are too vague to get any kind of information from them. And the second side of this page is the creation. Briato, it says in the Talmud that its creation is similar to that of a fish, meaning like a fish that lives in the ocean, because this would say maybe it's soft, maybe it's like a fish. Rather, they come from eggs just like fish, they're soft inside just like fish, there are many things, the similarities they have to fish. The body color, the Talmud says the body of the chilazon is like the sea. So it's not just the dye that comes out of it, but the body is also like the sea. And we see here, uh, there's a certain blue-green color. Um, it's similar to the sea bed that it sits on. Not necessarily to the sea, to the water, to the ocean. If you know much about the sea, it doesn't really have a color. But the sea bed is what has the color, and this is what it's similar to. So what do you do, though, with this midash? And this has always bothered me since I was a child. It comes out of the ocean once every 70 years. Seems like some mythical creature, more than a, a snail that you could just dive and get. Or maybe it just comes on land every seventy years. So, uh, Art Scroll seems to want to understand from here there was an amphibious creature. It came onto land every seventy years. There, are people are, are splitting hairs over here. Rather, the Talmud, the expression of, of once in every seventy years, once in every hundred years, that expression is used in the Gemara to refer to something which is it's it's rare. It's something that that. It's like a big deal to go get it. Um, the Rambam doesn't even mention this in the laws of Tzitzit. So he doesn't even codify the 70 year thing into Halakha. And really, when the Rambam does something like that, it tells you either he didn't know what to do with it, or it wasn't, it wasn't part of the identifying features or characteristics of the Chilazon. It was meant to teach you some deeper idea, mm-hmm. which is out of the scope of the Rambam's Mishnah Torah. Mm. And we find in the Talmud that the blood from the live chilazon is much better than the blood from the dead chilazon. And this is actually true. Once the snail dies, it quickly deteriorates. And really the dead snails are not good for much. And, and so you find the Gemara already is referring to that. None of these things are true necessarily by the squid that the Redziners are using. On page 3, the color of the dye is compared to a kela ilan, which is a certain plant you saw in the video that looks exactly like the tchelet. That tchelet and this kela ilan, really, if it wasn't for our science labs today that we could break down the chemical makeup of these things, wouldn't you wouldn't really know the difference. And so that already in and of itself shows that this color and this dye, they're, they're very similar colors. So they're both indigo. Helps in the process. Yes, science does help in the process. Yeah, indigo is a very common plant. grows very easily in America, too. It's used as medicine, as dye. So this would help us. It would, it's helping the case. The reason is, Chazal generally, when they're telling you about things, they use things which are common. 
like we mentioned, they use the olive to tell you what how much you need to eat, or they use the sunset. Or, they're trying to give you things that you can access on your own. And when they're when I they're get indigo powder for my practice sometimes. And is it the color of tchelat? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there you have it. Um, I mean, you, we we didn't lose the counterfeit. We know what the counterfeit is. So when we found the real thing and compared it to the counterfeit, we already knew we were looking at the real thing. Wow. The Talmudic description mentions the Nodi Bihuda brings down um, that there's a certain chemical process that it has to go through, <clears throat> and the murex has to go through the same chemical process that the Gemara mentions. The dye testing is the same. The dye quality. And this is the important part here, which uh, Jack was bringing up. Lo ifrad hazute chizute. If its color is permanent, then it's valid. Its dyeing is well known for its steadfast beauty and does not change. The Amma says the tchelt is known for how hard it holds onto the wool. So let's look at the physical evidence. The murex dye blinds, binds very tightly to wool and is among the fastest of dyes known to the ancient world. Three days in strong bleach has no effect. It's a... Uh, that's an incredible thing. You know, days. We're talking about days inside a very vicious chemical. And it doesn't take effect on it. The Gemara mentions in Mazach Megillah that treasures buried in the sand refer to the Chilazon. That's obviously not a squid if it's buried in the sand. And rather the murex burrows into the sand on the, on the seabed. And so we again find another thing. Last but not least, it's not a proof, but it's an illusion. The Raviyah, which is one of the Rishonim. He was from the Balei Tosafot. So he's an Ashkenazi Rishon. He refers to the Gemara Yerushalmi that talks about Chilazon and he uses the Greek word of Porphyra. Porphyra is the Greek word still used to refer to the Murex snail. And so this is not even something that disappeared we have to rediscover. This is a Greek word that refers to the snail that we have currently rediscovered. And so you find that already in the times of the Rishonim they knew what it was. Just for whatever reason they didn't have the ability to go down and, and harvest and pull them out and you could say it was because of Roman persecution it was because we weren't practically in the land of Israel uh, but the science behind it, the Gemalot behind it the history behind it the geography that goes into this it's almost beyond the shadow of a doubt that this Murex snail is the Chilazon in which we, we were always praying for it to have it come back to us yeah, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov has a prayer in, in the Kutet Filot now we come back to the land of Israel where we'll rediscover the Tchelet he really felt it in his blood, and we were going to go back home and rediscover the Tchelet. That could be the connection, by the way. The reason why Brest of Rosh to Tchelet is because their rabbi had it in his prayers, that when they'd come home, they would rediscover it. If you'd like to look up more things about Tchelet, and the history, and the, dis- the arguments between Rav Herzog, and the Ritzin Rebbe, and the Briskarav, and all that, there's a website called tchelet.org, or .info, it should be on one of these papers, or on the packet that's going around. It has hours and hours of audio, video, resources, printable things, books you can buy about this it's discussion. Well documented. It's, it's, like very, it's, it's, it's not a sh- you know, People would like you to believe, like, oh, some crazy guys in Israel think that they found Tchelet. It's really not the truth. The truth is that some crazy people outside of Israel are refusing to accept that this is the Tchelet. The discussion is, is quite to the contrary. In the land of Israel, there's a snail that lives on the coast in a very specific region. We have archaeological evidence that points that people used to die with this material. In the, same ma- area. in the same area. It matches the exact same color of the forgery the Talmud mentions against. The, the, all the steps that the Talmud mentions about the Chilazon match up to this snail. I agree with our parents' statement at this point, and I did my research that that time, that he's correct. It's a convincing argument that Melech HaMashiach is going to wear this. It's just There's nothing to be afraid about. So the question today is not should you wear Tchelet? The question really, and this is the most complicated part of the Tchelet discussion, is how do you wear Tchelet? We haven't tied Tchelet in 2,000 years. How do you do it? How do you tie it? But I'm going to pause at this point, and I just want to hear, what are your feelings so far about Tchelet? And I'll, I have this show until going around. Uh, the small packet is the Red Zener Tchelet, and they always sell the packet separate from the strings, uh, because they know that it rubs off. And they have a really nice history in the back. But their Rebbe, um, that's the Red Zinner. They right found there. the Tchelet. The, the, the Tchelet they have, it matches all of the sources about the Tchelet. This is, must be the one. And <laughs> they're the sole manufacturers of it. And then it says, 
in the back. Please don't put it in a washing machine. Please don't put it in a dryer. Please don't wash it. You'll even look in English. Don't it says wear it. wool light. <laughs> don't touch it. Don't yeah. use any kind of wool uh, cleaner on it. Uh, and this one stands up to bleach. Yeah. And so, with all respect, I'm not putting down the Rezino Hasidim. They inspired the movement which helped us find Khalid. But, Emet, Emet, we prayed. How many times a day do we say the Torah is true? And if the Torah is true, so at a certain point, my Rebbe, he lived 150 years ago, he, he wasn't able to access this truth. We are, so we finished his work. We finished his holy endeavor. That would be the integral, that would be a, a way of integrity, a road of integrity. Not only that, but maybe they're kind of torturing that animal that's un- unnecessary. That unnecessarily doesn't need to be produced. Uh, it's true. How do they harvest the animal? Do they have to go into the ocean to get it, or does it come up on, on the beach? They dive it by hand, like That's you saw in the video. They, they grab it with their hands. Um, I wonder if that can be harvested like fish farms. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how it looks. You know, this this is still a pretty mom-and-pop industry. Like It's done by hand mostly. I'm sure as the years have gone since that video was made, it's not just four people. I mean, they're in every tzitzit store in Israel. And they're, they're all over the place. They're putting out a lot more than they used to. I'll tell you the truth is their color has also gotten better. You know, the tchelet here, this, this nice blue that you see, when I first bought tchelet, it was a very pale blue. And either they, they didn't have enough money to put enough tchelet into the clothing, into diet, or they've really figured out how to get it to hold into the wool. I don't know what's changed since then, but the, the colors today are much better. A better exacto than to. to cut those. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a better knife. And I'll tell you the truth is that, uh, one of these days when we plan to take a trip together to Israel, to have a tchelet factory, and I'd love to go there with you, yeah, and sure. to walk through there and see it, and touch it with your own hands, dye something with your own hands, and and our students have gone there, they've made their own tchelet, and they wear it on their tzitziot. It's an incredible thing. What is the biblical citation of this? You know, in the that's a very good question. The Shema tells us, "May the bear." Let us bring a sidra out. I never like to read psukim. We have a sidra. I'll bring. I'll bring our own one. Actually, I have one right here. Sorry, Dan. Here. You looking for the shema? Yeah. Hashem says to Moshe, "Daber bnei Yisrael v'amata lehem v'asu lehem tzitzit al kanfei v'gdehem ladorotam." That you should make tzitzit on the corners of your garments for every generation. Uh, for all throughout all the generations. The Snyder is connected to the land of Israel. Very good. V'natenu al tzitzit, and on the tzitzit there should be a kanan, a kanaf on the corner. Betil tchelat, a string of tchelat. V'aylechem the tzitzit, or itemot, and then it becomes what's called tzitzit, and then you should see them muschatem to come mitzvot adonai. You'll remember all the mitzvot of Hashem. V'asitem adam, you'll perform them. V'lo tatur achel ovchem v'reinachem v'shar dem zonim achavim. And you won't stray after your heart, and this is what's going to remind you of of Hashem. Um, if you would like to have a part two to this class. The discussion of how we tell them, it's a fascinating discussion. The question is really as follows. Is tchelet a separate mitzvah from tzitzit? Meaning, do you get an extra mitzvah for wearing tchelet? Or is the mitzvah of tzitzit not really complete without tchelet? In the Torah, you could read that these are two separate biblical mitzvot. There's a mitzvah of having tzitzit, that is a mitzvah of adding tchelet to the tzitzit. Or you could really say, well, if the whole reason is to remember the mitzvot, and our rabbis tell us the way you remember the mitzvot is by looking at the blue string and remembering the ocean, which reminds you of the sky, which reminds you of Hashem, so that maybe tchilet is the mitzvah of yeah. tzitzit. And you'll see that there, there's a, a big debate around here, and this debate really leads to, is it urgent <coughs> to put tchilet onto your tzitzit? Um, I'm not the expert on, on tchilet, but I, I do hope that after today, you may be thinking twice about wearing tchilet. And I'll suggest the following. If a few of you decide that you want to wear tchelet, at least on your talit, maybe just on Shabbat, you don't have to wear it all the time. If you're embarrassed, so on the tzitzit that you wear under your clothes, I don't know, you don't know have to be embarrassed. Today people have mohawks and nose rings, and all kinds of, you don't have to be scared to put on a blue string on your, on your uh, so tzitzit. Who determines how many strings have it? Very good. So who determines? That's all part of this next discussion. You see there's pictures, how you tie, how many of the strings have to be blue. I'll, I'll fill you on that. If a few of you are interested in putting on tchelet, let's go ahead and order some tchelet. And I'll give a class. It doesn't have to be during kolo on the side, or it could be during kolo for nothing you do it. And we'll tie it together. It's a hard thing to tie tchelet. It's not simple. But I'll sit here with you, and we'll tie this tchelet so together. Add it to and you'll have to, 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 you, you have to get a new ones. You, if you buy the tchelet, it comes with a replacement tzitzit. 
So you take off the tzitzit and you tie it. It's a very quick it's process. Daggers, you know, I just replaced. Mine. Just replaced. You remember was uh, Yeah, I remember. Tzitzit. I remember. Um, the mitzvah of tchelet. The mitzvah of tchelet is to get from New York. I think they sell them at around eighty dollars for the is strings. The equivalent of the two twenty shekels. Yes, uh, the, the two twenty is a little bit of a better price. But is let's it? say if you would ship it from Israel, it costs you the same thing. That's for a whole set. Or? That's for all four corners with the white strings. It does not include, no talit included. You know, bring your own talit. <laughs> uh, so it's without the talit. Um, if you're interested, let me know. It doesn't have to be right now. Um, I think a few people are. I know uh, there's at least two people at this table that are interested. Um, if you, so let's, let's, let's do a second part. Yeah. But maybe I'll... Are you interested, Barry? Yeah, yeah why? Well, okay, I'll, you have. I have, I have the Bro, you interested? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Bo yeah. I'm not putting anybody else on the spot. If you're interested, tell me. If, uh, if the issue is a matter of price... We can help with that. So we'll take care of it. Really, really. You'll hand out scholarships. So we, I, if you will tell me you were well tchelet on your talit. Yeah. I'll help. Got Personally. A special price. No, really. I, I'm serious. I'll help. So what's the Ashley Nazi for you? Very good. Very, this is a great question. And maybe I'll leave off with this because it's yeah. almost every time. There, this is not an Ashkenazi Sephardic okay. conflict. This is really, like I mentioned yesterday in my class, if you really believe that this is a special generation, it's more of a hashkafic thing. If you believe that this is the beginning of the redemption, the Jews have come home, you know, it, it would very much believe, okay, so now is also time for rediscovering Tchelet. If you believe we're just another last generation in exile, waiting for Mashiach to come riding on a pony, probably you will feel, what, yeah, why, why now is any different now, than 100 now, now. years ago? Let's wait. Let's wait. Let's yeah, wait till Mashiach yeah. comes to be yeah. sure. And, but let's, let's tell you, there is an Ashkenazi Sephardic difference regarding to the amount of strings you put on your tzitzit. The wording in the Torah is, when the tenu al tzitzit, hakanaf, al tzitzit hakanaf, you take on the corner of the clothing, petil techelet, a string of techelet. Tell me, what does it mean, a string of techelet? How many strings do you have on one corner? Four. Four strings, which are folded over yeah, into eight. So they, you know, there's a hole, and the strings go through, and there are essentially eight strings instead of four. When it says petil tchelet, a string of tchelet, how many strings? Yeah. Is it one long string, which would make how many strings? Two strings out of eight, mm-hmm. meaning <clears throat> one out of four. Or is it a half string? Or is it a half string? Is a half string, meaning one out of eight strings. And you'll see here, look at your pictures. I, I, I gave you some pictures. Nine, opinions. <laughs> Nine different opinions on how to tie. Yeah. Four yeah. different opinions on how many strings. The Rambam, look, look on page, it's the other side of this page. On the top left. The Rambam, half of one string, when folded becomes one of eight strings, is Tchelet. The Rambam understands the Pasuk in Bamidbar the following manner. Put upon the fringe of each corner one thread of blue. Only the windings around the white core must be tchelet. Meaning, the outside. that it's it's the outside string, so it's half a string, and that's the one that you wrap with. The Ravad, who was Ashkenazi, and he fought with the Ramam all the time. And then he wrote a, a, a book, in which said, the whole point of it was to prove the Rambam wrong. Um, and the Aruch, Everything. they hold, based on the Sifre, that one full string, meaning when it's folded, it becomes two of the eight, must be tchelet. Rashi and Tosfot, I've seen very few people follow this opinion. They hold two full strings, meaning four out of eight are tchelet. That is the most expensive tchelet to buy. Yeah. Essentially, it'll cost you like $160 for a set instead of 80 uh, Because it just goes on the amount of tchelet you have. The Rambam and the Ravad, they're not really any price difference. Half a string, a full string. But let me tell you, that one night, when I was thinking that I was very holy in Yerushalayim, <laughs> Thinking was the key word. Yeah. I, I was reading a book called The Sharei Kedusha from the Rav Chaim Vital. Mm-hmm. Rav Chaim Vital, who was a student of the Arizal, says that his rabbi held that Tchelet would be one string out of eight, like the Rambam. It's a rare occurrence to find the Rambam and Arizal on the same page about something. He had an interesting reasoning for this. His reasoning according to Kabbalah is that there are seven levels of, of heaven and one layer of the world. And he talks about different worlds, in which case the tchelet of the tzitzit is one string, that's one, 
and then you leave seven over. He doesn't see any significance in the numbers two and six, rather one and seven. And of Chaim Vital writes that also according to Kabbalah, if one were to put Chelat on their Tziziot, they would put one string out of eight. When we went to Rav Peretz, my friend, Rav Josh and I, we went to Rav Peretz, said, Rabbi, we want to put on Chelat, 2009. Let's do it. Who cares? They won't no, marry us because we have blue strings on our corner. Who cares? They won't take our kids to Shiva because we have blue, kids, blue strings on our corner. Who cares? We went to Rav Peretz, and Rabbi Peretz said, I'm not showing you my tzitzit. I said, why? He said, because I only spent enough time in the factory to tell you if it's real tchelet or not. I did not spend enough time in the factory to tell you which opinion is the correct one. Whether to wear or not. <laughs> right? So I can tell you whether to wear, just not how to wear it. So Josh pushes his rabbi, you've got to tell me, I have to do it now. He said, you know, in the street, most people do it like the rabbi, so go do like the rabbi. And Josh went the same day, he put on tchelet, like the rabbi, and you'll see that's number two, opinion number two. That's how he ties his tchelet, though with the knots inside. So it's two, but with the traditional knots in between those twirls. And it's a nice look. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. Yep. I didn't put on tchelet for about another three months. I wasn't happy with the repairs. To answer it. He wouldn't answer it. He wouldn't show me his tzitzit. So one day, I printed this paper out for him. <laughs> and I went to him at the end of class. I said, Rabbi, you have another 45 minutes here. And you have to give those boys tests. And they're waiting for you for tests. So here, I'll make it very easy. I'm not going to leave you alone. I won't let you give them tests until you tell me how to tie my tchelet. <laughs> he said, but it's not emet. I don't have the truth. I said, I don't care that emet. You tell me what I should do. He looked at me. And he said, okay, the Rambam. I said, great. You answered question number one. The Rambam. Now, it's, it's logical to refer to say the Rambam because Maran, we know there's a rule. Wherever the Shulchan Aruch doesn't say what to do, you follow the Rambam. So for me, as a smart person, it's very easy to know that I would follow the Rambam. I said, Rabbi, but which of these nine ways would you tie your tchelet? He said, what do you want from me? I said, I want you to tell me what to do. So he looked, and he made sure nobody was listening. He said, okay, number eight. Yeah. Number eight? Yes, number eight. I said, like the Redzina Rebbe? He said, yes, don't use his tchelet, but tie the way he would tie. Because his opinion includes the Rambam's chuliot, the, and I'll talk about that in another class if we have. It also includes the Shulchan Aruch's number of twirls. It also includes the Arizal's braids. And it also has the five knots, according to all the opinions. He said, in this case, this covers all the ground. He said, or Rabbi, it doesn't follow anyone's opinion. I said, good. He said, follow it. So I do a variation of a mix between eight and nine. But I'll tell you, one year, about a year and a half ago, I went to Dvora to Yerushalayim, and I caught Harav Peretz in his office without his coat on. And I caught him without his sweater on. And I caught him on a day where he happened to be wearing tzitziot outside. And... And you're like, no? <laughs> I looked. And listen, I'm already close enough to Harav Peretz, I could do such a thing. I went like this, I pulled the tzitziot, I said, ah, he does it the same way. So, this is the way Harav Peretz ties tchelet, that's the way that I recommend other people to tell it. And I'll tell you the reason for it. The reason is, it follows the Rambam's opinion, which is very important, at least to a partial degree. It follows the Ashkenazi tradition, which is to tie 7, 8, 11, 13. That's Maran's opinion. But it's important that Ashkenazi, they're not going to change now the way they tie their tchelet. It's the same way you would tie tzitzil. It follows the Rizal slash Benish Chai's opinion to put braids on the tchelet, which makes sense now for Sfaradim as well, and it follows a bunch of other opinions which are good to put together, and so I consider this the Klal Yisrael way to tie tchelet, but there's no right or wrong way, any one of these ways are kosher, but that's the way I personally tie it. Um, it's the hardest way to tie tchelet, there are other ways are very simple, you just twirl, 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 yeah. tie a knot, and it's good to go. Um, so I'm ending the class for now, but I wanted to put it in your heart, think about it, think about it. Maybe it's time for you not just to start doing another mitzvah. You have a lot of mitzvahs you can start doing. This is a mitzvah that's directly connected to the redemption of the Jewish people. If the Jews are wearing tchelet, that means that we're beyond our exile already. You're making a move on your body, on yourself. I'm not in exile mode anymore. I'm not a galut Jew. I'm a Jew that's connected to the living Torah of Hashem. I'm connected to Eretz Yisrael. And think about it. Take these papers home. If you want more resources, I will email you enough things to read until the day we finish section uh, uh, the first whole book of Shulchan Aruch and uh, I hope to see people making a, a decision there's no pressure if not I understand why people would feel uh, conservative if it's an issue of money please talk to me I'm happy to make things work um, and Bezat Hashem 
I look forward to a follow-up class to maybe how to tie the tchelet. Take these papers home. If you're going to use them, show them to your wife, show them to your kids. And we'll see them as well. Thanks for putting on the world. It looks like nine. Yeah, I'll tell you this again. Yeah, it's supposed to go on the tally too? On the tally also. So both? Yes. Yes. And, but I would say start with your talit. It's, it's not the one you wear the most, but it's the one that shows the most.